Coming up on Global Business, investment surge. China's foreign direct investment reached 110 billion yuan in January, marking a 20% month-on-month growth. Housing trends. Despite a decline in home prices in major Chinese cities in January, the rate of decline has slowed down. And medical staff unrest. More than 9,200 9, doctors applied to resign in South Korea, while junior doctors in Wales went on strike. From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is Global Business. I'm Jun Jun Feng. Chinese President Xi Jinping has chaired the fourth meeting of the Central Committee for Financial and Economic Affairs. He urged quicker product upgrades to promote high-quality development and he called for a new round of large-scale equipment updates and trading of consumer goods. Xi Jinping said logistics costs must be reduced for society, increasing core competitiveness and improving economic efficiency. The meeting urged a technological transformation and large-scale recycling. It also called for development of the low-altitude economy and unmanned driving. Fresh data from China's Ministry of Commerce shows that China has experienced a rise in newly funded foreign companies in January. According to the data, more than 4,500 foreign enterprises were set up during this period, which is a 74% increase compared to the previous year. The actual use of foreign capital in China was valued at 112 billion yuan, down about 11% on a yearly basis but up 20% on a monthly basis. Among various sectors, high-tech manufacturing accounted for 35% of the total foreign capital attracted. Additionally, countries such as France, Switzerland, Germany, Australia and Singapore saw a significant rise in value as sources of foreign capital. China's top securities regulator has reiterated its determination to strengthen the evaluation of IPO candidates and crack down on illegal activities that could harm investors. The China Securities Regulatory Commission has also denied reports claiming that it will impose a 10-year retroactive period for violations. Instead, the Commission plans to substantially increase the number of on-site inspections conducted on listed companies. Now, For more insights on the CSRC's resolve to tighten IPO reviews and inspections, let's bring in Wang Jianhui, General Manager of R&D at Capital Securities. Uh, he joins us from Miami, Florida. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. Wang. Uh, what's the key <laughs> message you're getting from securities regulator? Uh, what's, uh, what are they trying to convey by pledging uh, strengthening oversight on listed companies? Well, I think uh, three major points are, are worthy of attention here. The first, the, the CSRC is uh, focusing on accurate and uh, timely accounting and compliant uh, information exposure to make sure the investors have reliable foundations of the value analysis. Mm. And the more tougher uh, ac uh, actions will be carried out against the frauds and uh, violations, especially in IPO process. And secondly, uh, authority will be using all the tools or weapons to contain or punish the, uh, the insider trade and the market manipulations. Mm. The bad guys will be facing m much higher cost for their wrongdoings. And secondly, the authority also has made clear that their measures or actions are only targeted at those few bad guys. So the majority of the 5,000 uh, listed companies are still the model uh, of the uh, corporate, uh, modern corporate governance and um, business operations. Still, they have uh, contributed one fourth, one fourth of the uh, national tax revenues. Back Great. To uh, what are the factors that are driving the recent rebound in Asia market? We see the Shanghai Composite gaining for the eighth day today. And what's the outlook for the near future? Well, technically. Technically speaking, the 14% uh, the surge during the last five, uh, eight trading days is the market corrections to the 9.7% uh, fall between January 26 and February 5th. So uh, the smarter investors just uh, return to the market to pick up oversold shares. And the CSRC, who has launched a series of accommodative uh, policy measures lately, also deserve some credits or even applause for the good market performance. 
Uh, so far still, we, uh, we cannot be too optimistic. We still have to wait the Shanghai Composite Index uh, breaking the uh, 3,130 uh, 3, line, which is the 60-day moving average, to confirm the turnaround of the trend in the midterm. Back to you. Okay, I'll remember that mark. 3,130, right? Yes, I'll correct. Mark that, yeah. I'll mark that line. How has the securities regulators restrictive approach? You just said they are punishing uh, rule breakers. They're punishing the few bad guys, you know, backdoor traders. How does their the regulators move impact the overall environment? Well, the uh, uh, the CRSC uh, policy measures or moves are always viewed as significant weather vane to the market. So investors all, uh, usually choose long strategy when the uh, policy environment is accommodated. So, so far, the, uh, uh, the authority has strength strengthened the uh, market confidence uh, greatly. And uh, I, I think the, uh, the improvement is on the way. And uh, secondly, uh, the, uh, the listed companies will be also more aware of their responsibilities to create investment value for the investors. And in the future, we may uh, see more mergers and acquisitions, which bring in high quality assets to the listed companies and uh, uh, get rid of the uh, low productive capacities. So the, uh, the market will be more active and uh, more health, uh, healthier. Back to you. Hopefully. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you My for pleasure. your time, Mr. Wang Jianhui, General Manager of R&D at Capital Securities. We turn to China's property sector. Home prices continue to cool in May around the country with an narrow decline observed in both new home and pre-owned markets. In the four first-tier cities, prices of new homes dropped by three-tenths of percent on average. Only Shanghai experienced a slight increase, while both second-tier and third-tier cities saw a four-tenths of percent decrease compared to the previous month. The downward trend also extended to the pre-owned home market as prices in first-tier cities declined by 1% on a monthly basis with narrowing decline of 0.1 percentage points. Second-tier cities experienced a 0.6% fall, while third-tier cities reported a 7 tenths of percent decrease. Earlier, my colleague Sun Ye was in downtown Beijing to provide detailed breakdown of the measures taken to boost the housing market during the Chinese New Year holiday and the response of those uh, cities uh, with uh, the policies. Now, the latest and biggest lift this week for the housing market is the 25 basis point cut to over five-year loan prime rate. That is the biggest LPR card ever by the central bank. Now, many lenders base their mortgage rates on the over five-year LPR, and Tuesday's cut has made the home mortgage rates approach historic close. On January the 12th, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development with uh, financial supervisory authorities issued a document document on establishing a coordinated uh, mechanism for urban real estate financing. And by the end of January, the first batch of projects to get financing support have been named. And then China's five major state-owned banks disclosed that over 8,000 projects are eligible for that financing support. And analysts in the uh, industry have said expected, it's expected that more projects will receive financing support and that buyers could have their expectation stabilized and if we have seen uh, responses very soon especially for China's biggest cities uh, who are quick to lose their buying restrictions uh, Guangzhou had been among the first to respond canceling its restriction on purchasing houses of more than 120 square meters and Shanghai had also changed its housing purchase restriction policy now it's supporting non-local single people to buy houses and Shenzhen had since canceled its its requirement of years of residence and social security for home purchases and here in Beijing the capital city where everyone is watching for its moves one of its key uh, districts Tongzhou had also lifted some of its restrictions on buying houses since then but the market that are the most responsive to all of those boosting policies over this holiday have actually mostly come from second-tier cities the Shell uh, Research Institute um, said during this year's spring 
Spring Festival holiday, second-hand house viewing and transactions in key cities has uh, has significantly rebounded uh, compared to 2023, with the second-hand house transaction increasing by more than 70 percent year on year. It says in second and third-tier city, uh, cities where policy boosts are even more significant, consumers are more willing to tap back into the housing market. Here are five questions to help you understand the impact of the recent cut on the five-year loan prime rate, which directly influences borrowing costs for current and prospective homeowners. Take a listen. What impact can the rate cut have? The recent 25 basis point reduction in the five-year loan prime rate will save 150 yuan per month on a 30-year 1 million yuan mortgage. While this may seem modest, since 2018, five-year LPR has been cut by 90 basis points in total. That offers sizable relief for those with genuine needs of home ownership. How many families stand to benefit? Statistics indicate that 43.4% of Chinese urban families are currently paying mortgages out of a total of 240 million urban families. So approximately 100 million urban families will benefit from the rate cut. What is the total amount of money saved? China's total outstanding mortgages amount to around 38 trillion yuan. The rate cut is projected to save 96 billion yuan in interest payments per year, as estimated by Goldman Sachs. This equals to 17 basis points of household disposable income and will contribute to consumption. What does rate cut reveal about Chinese economy? The rate cut demonstrates the government's determination to bolster the housing sector. The cut also indicates that Chinese commercial banks, you know, those big state banks, are prepared to withstand the effects of lower lending rates. Remember, in 2023, large state-owned banks lowered deposit rates by 65 basis points, ensuring their net interest margins. This proactive approach sets China apart from the situation in the U.S. during the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis. The Chinese central bank governor Pan Gongsheng said last year that the impact of the housing sector's challenges on China's banking system was limited. And why hasn't the central bank cut the one-year LPR? The decision not to cut the one-year LPR this time reflects China's cautious approach. Premier Li Chang gave a clear signal in the Davos World Economic Forum earlier this year that China won't resort to huge stimulus because that will accumulate long-term risk. However, while no cut has been made now, it does not rule out the possibility of one cut or more cuts later in the year. The U.S. Fed is anticipated to cut rates by June that will narrow the interest gap between the dollar and the yuan. China will have more room to cut one-year rate to support the real economy. When the real economy shows more signs of recovery, this in turn could help restore home buyer confidence and stabilize the housing sector. Earlier this month, China implemented its largest ever cut on the over five-year loan prime rate, reducing it by 25 basis points to 3.95 percent. The move is in, aimed at stimulating economic growth and providing support to the housing market. Additionally, major cities such as Shanghai have made adjustments to their housing policies, specifically targeting a particular demographic of home buyers. Our Zhang Shixuan has more. Though it was a workday afternoon, this property sales office in Shanghai's suburban Fengxian district was busy talking to house hunters. I've been in Shanghai for a bit more than three years. I'm from Anhui. The favorable policy is well-timed for me. I'm not yet married. Previously, I had to pay social insurance for five years, but now it's only three years to be eligible for an apartment, so I want to buy a small apartment for myself. I work nearby. I'm from Hanan. Now unmarried individuals from outside Shanghai can buy a home and I don't have to wait for a long period of time. I started looking around for an apartment once I heard the news. This project is new. I want to buy a 99 square meter apartment. Sales opened for this project right after the launch of the new policies in Shanghai, with almost 750 residential units available. On the first day, all terraced houses were sold out. In just two days, the developer received inquiries from around 400 groups of clients.
The latest policy change is designed to give a boost to the market in Shanghai's outskirts by expanding who is eligible to buy a home. Now, singles who don't have a Shanghai hukou will be able to buy as long as they've been paying taxes here for three years. Previously, the exemption only applied to families after five years. Shanghai suburban Fengxian and Qingpu districts now have the most preferential policies for single individuals originally from other areas of the country. Other districts in the city's outskirts still require social insurance or income tax payments for five years. But that's still attractive enough to potential home buyers. Projects in areas like Zhongjiang and Tangzhen in Pudong New Area, Xinjuang and Qibao in Minhang District, and Gutsuan in Baoshan District have become more attractive since they are all outside the Outer Ring Road. Before the launch of the new policies, most home buyers in the city's outskirts were families, and now, more singles without a Shanghai hukou are coming since they have been paying social insurance for five years, thus generating more home buying demand. They prefer apartments ranging from 80 to 120 square meters. The city government has been adjusting housing policies since the second half of last year. And the most recent changes target specific areas outside the city's outer ring road. Experts expect these changes combined with a lowered loan rate to bolster confidence in the market. These areas are promoting industrial transformation and new industrial growth, and they are also struggling to reach a balance between employment and housing supplies. Now, China's lowest mortgage rate is below 4%. In Shanghai, the lowest rate can reach 3.85%. In 2021, cities like Beijing and Shanghai kept the mortgage rate close to 6%. Yan expects that developers with new projects hitting the market to see inquiries increase now that the Spring Festival is over, and that this will be reflected in the online trading data in March. Zhang Shixuan, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. Medical staff unrest. Oh, coming up next, we will bring you more headlines on global business. More than 9,200 doctors applied to resign in South Korea, where junior doctors in Wales went on strike. Strengthening the foundation for a future powered by innovation where high technology, high efficiency, and high quality converge. These three pillars are set to propel China's new productive forces and supercharge the Chinese economy into a new era of development. New industries, new models, and new growth momentum. Join CGTN as we guide you through the new productive forces poised to redefine the Chinese economy. Now move on to some other news about the global central banks. The European Central Bank has reported an annual loss of 1.3 billion euros, making it the first loss since 2004. The loss can be attributed to significant payouts due to higher interest rates. Despite the loss, ECB has assured it will not affect its ability to conduct monetary policy. However, it has issued a warning regarding the need to avoid continued loss in the future. Bank of Japan Governor Kazuo Ueda has said Japan's economy is currently experiencing a state of inflation rather than deflation. Ueda said the importance of considering the price development over a long period, specifically looking at the time frame of a year or a year and a half or two years when making policies. And inflation in Singapore unexpectedly jumped slowed in January with a year-on-year -year growth rate of 2.9% compared to 3.7% in December. The slowdown occurred despite recent increase in goods and services taxes. The Monetary Authority of Singapore is set to review its monetary policy, which utilizes exchange rate as its prime tool in April. And in some news on protests by medical professionals from across the globe, more than 9,000 medical interns and residents in South Korea have applied to quit their jobs to, protect, to protest the government's push to recruit more medical students. 
that accounted for 75% of all doctors in the country's major hospitals. Eight thousands of them have already walked off their jobs. Their collective walkouts have caused cancellations of surgeries and disrupted hospital operations. Meanwhile, junior doctors in Wales are walking out for the second time in a row over pay and working conditions. The British Medical Association in Wales decided to bail out to ballot members in August with almost 98% voting in favour of in industrial action. As a major agricultural exporter to the European Union, Morocco insists it respects EU quality standards and legal requirements and that Europe is the a party benefiting more from the trade. This comes as protesting farmers in Spain continue to block roads and attack Moroccan trucks transporting cheaper vegetables, which they say do not meet EU standards. Adnan Chauci has the details. The Moroccan Confederation of Agriculture and Rural Development, or COMADER, has strongly condemned the attacks on Moroccan produce, describing them as baseless. COMADER also emphasized the good quality of Moroccan produce, saying the country's agricultural exports were strictly in line with all legal standards. Moroccan exporters of agricultural products have been facing a difficult time due to the serious problems with European farmers and not states. It started in France and now it's happening in Spain, where farmers want to close the border crossing of Algeciras, Spain. We reject the claim of so-called unfair competition. Moroccan farmers and exporters respect all European standards in terms of high quality during the production and export process. The European Union is a major importer of agricultural goods from Morocco. Over the first nine months of 2023, the North African country's exports of fresh produce to the EU totaled 1.83 billion euros. The bloc relies on Moroccan imports to keep its markets supplied. Recent data from free trade agreements data between Morocco and Europe shows that only a very limited portion of exports were affected. Let's bear in mind that Europe exports to us more than it imports from Morocco. Europe benefits from trade with Morocco. As a result of the export cutback due to the current crisis in Europe, popular markets in Morocco have recorded a significant drop in the prices of vegetables. The Moroccan trucks which were intercepted in Europe have a direct impact on fresh food products here in the market. The inflation is coming down and all foodstuffs are available at reasonable prices. Tomatoes, potatoes and carrots are 75% cheaper now. A few weeks ago, French farmers also accused their Spanish counterparts of unfair competition, vandalizing and emptying trucks carrying Spanish agricultural products. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN. The U.S. just landed a commercial mission on the surface of the moon, naming its first lunar landing in more than 50 years. The robotic probe, known as Odysseus, successfully touched down near the lunar south pole on Thursday. It's also the first spacecraft made by a private company to pull off a moon landing. Sidi Chin talks to Jim Head, a professor from Brown University, about the achievement. It's really exciting, nail-biting, all the way down to the surface of the moon. And it's not easy to do. So this is a very significant thing. Um, you know, this is a private company. NASA is trying to develop sort of like a Federal Express to space. Okay, you pay the company to take the payload. NASA will pay the scientists to develop the instruments, and then it goes to the moon. It's much cheaper than doing it all through uh, large government entities, et cetera. So it's a great day, a successful mission. Um, touchdown, and, you know, there'll be plenty more. Uh, is this the future? Is this what we can see for the foreseeable future for these trips into space? I think that, you know, NASA has always engaged uh, commercial entities, business, if you will, uh, to build the spacecraft. The Apollo lunar module, uh, the command module, uh, all these things were built by uh, different companies, okay? Uh, and so, NASA's always been developing this key technology and the challenges to make them be able to develop these capabilities. But it's it's really to improve uh, the number of people that can work, the you know the economy, et cetera, and that's what NASA's trying to do. So SpaceX, which launched this to the moon, 
was one of those companies. They got a lot of NASA aid to build the company, et cetera. And now they are, in fact, sending rockets out to space um, and also sending, uh, you know, astronauts up to the International Space Station. So it's a really good plan. Um, and it's, you know, it's good to see it successful in, in having a private company actually design, build, and run a spacecraft mission independent of NASA, except for the funding. What do you hope to see and what will you be looking forward to in the coming days as this all unfolds? Well, I think, again, the operations. You know, landing is the first step. That's the first step. It means you, you, you've gotten to your destination, but it's like with the moon. Uh, you know, once the astronauts uh, landed on the surface of the moon for a particular mission, um, you know, that was just the beginning. We had the mission. So people had to, you know, we had plans for traverses, sample collection, deploying instruments, et cetera. So that's exactly what we'll be looking at in the next few days. How successful are they in deploying the instruments? Uh, how, you know, the, the, essentially the meat of the mission, if you will. And, you know, one of my friends from Apollo, David Scott, the Apollo 15 commander, he, uh, we were communicating by email. Uh, during this thing, and he was kind of comparing it to where they were when they were going around the moon and getting to ready to land in the Hadley Apennine region. And it was a real thrill to share that with him, too. So he had a good thumbs up for the Intuity Machines team. I mean, it's been it's fantastic. Definitely big thumb up for that private company to be able to land a probe on the moon. That will do for this edition of Global Business. I'm Junior Phil. Thanks for watching. So if you can continue with more news and views, stay with us.